We are trying to create uh, intellectual properties under the Z brand and the Z Mindspace is one such initiative in that direction. In today's world of changing uh, market dynamics, it is essential uh, to introspect the role of the corporate brand uh, to a company's business and success. And uh, as we all know, an unpredictability is a new constant in our workplace. And, and that is why when we conceived Mindspace, we wanted to uh, get speakers who were from uh, you know, diverse backgrounds but who could add immense value uh, to the event. So thank you for giving me a patient here. I would like to hand over to Ramesh, uh, who is our moderator for the evening, and uh, he will introduce the two speakers. Thank you very much. Good evening. My name is Ramesh Jude Thomas. I work for a brand valuation advisory called Equitor, as uh, Roland just mentioned, which uh, brought brand valuation as a strategic tool to India for the first time in 2001. Now, the bad news is that mine is the face that you will be seeing for the longest period on the stage this evening. The good news is, for the better part of that, I'll be silent. At least I'll try to be. I'm also a marathon runner whenever my injuries allow me. There are 300 people in this room, so I want to check. How many marathon runners here? Brilliant. Okay, very good. We're in good hands. How many cycling enthusiasts here? More hands. All right. How many of the cycling enthusiasts have done more than 50 kilometers at one stretch? Super. Okay. Now, this is great. Our first speaker has done 50,000 kilometers at one stretch. How's that? That's Rob Lelwal. So when Rob and I first started chatting about this evening, I thought it might be prudent to first introduce all of us to him. Yeah? And I told him that in spite of all his travels, the people in this room traverse one of the toughest terrains in the world. It is also called the Indian Marketplace. With 22 official languages and over 1,600 dialects, at least as many subcultures and metaphors attached to them, changing needs that change with every 15 kilometers, the Indian market is nothing Rob, short of a complete nightmare for any professional. Ask anybody in this room with this break and they will tell you the headaches that they go through. We travel us, this common community, you and I, every week from this culture to another culture, bearing, braving bad roads, long security queues, very bad airline food, and sometimes we win like you. Very often we lose and fall flat on our faces as well. But the only difference is nobody calls us to give lectures and nobody televises us on National Geographic. But we go on relentlessly day after day. Now, I asked Rob most of all, out of his experiences, to share with us his tales of engagement, where he had to, you know, connect with strange people in strange situations to survive and to succeed. But before he does that, it is my pleasant duty to tell you a little more about this amazing guest of ours. Rob is a British-born, Hong Kong-based TV adventurer, writer, and speaker. His expeditions have seen him traveling on foot, by bicycle, and by boat through some of the harshest corners on Earth, including the frozen wastelands of Siberia, the hidden valleys of China, and the lonely passes of Afghanistan. His two most extraordinary expeditions, cycling from home sorry, cycling from Siberia and walking home from Mongolia were commissioned as television series for National Geographic. And his talks have enthralled tens of thousands of people across four continents, Asia, Australia, Europe, and in America. 
When speaking to business audiences, Rob relates the ever-growing challenges of the 21st century workplace to his own experiences. At times hilarious, at times deadly serious, these are trials and tribulations from the wildest lands in the world. However, he contends that with the right attitude, we can achieve more than we ever thought possible. Through telling stories from his adventures, whether it be walking across the Gobi Desert in winter, or pushing a bicycle through the jungles of Papua New Guinea, Rob encourages us to adopt the same principles for survival and success in the complex terrains in which we, all of us, operate every day. Rob and his lovely wife, Christine, live in Hong Kong, where they are also the national directors for the children's charity called Viva. He will tell you more about it during the coffee break. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Mr. Rob Lilwal. We have the, uh, the slides up on this screen as well, please. Thank you. Uh, it's really, really wonderful to be here uh, this evening in India. And just a little bit of background. Thank you so much for that introduction. And um, I should, just to give a little bit more background to myself, I actually used to be a geography teacher just outside Oxford in England. And I taught geography to young people for about two years. And I was looking at maps and teaching people about the world. But then I thought it's time to go and explore the world first hand. And so I decided I was going to go and explore the world on my bicycle. So I took my bicycle, I took my life savings, put my life savings in a bank, took my bank card, and then I thought instead of setting off from England and cycling off into the world, I think it'll be more fun if I start as far away from home as possible and then try to cycle home again. So to cut a long story short, I jumped on a plane and I flew right to the other side of the world, to the northeast edge of Russia, to a little city called Magadan. And when I got to Magadan, I got off the plane, I took my bicycle, I started cycling, and eventually it took me just over three years to get back home again. And this is the route that I took initially, starting in Siberia. That took a few months to get through those wastelands, then down through Japan, up through Korea, down through China to Hong Kong. That took about one year. But then I decided to take a little detour. So I kept on heading south, down through Papua New Guinea, and halfway around Australia. That took about one more year. Then I came back up through Southeast Asia, Tibet, down through India, across Central Asia, into the Middle East, finally into Europe, and on the home straight back to London. So that is the story I'm going to be telling you uh, today. And as I talk, I will bring up a map from time to time so you can chart our progress a little bit. And I'm also going to reflect a little bit on what I call my attitudes of adventure, which were the attitudes I needed to survive on this trip. And I should point out as well, in case you haven't already noticed, I'm a very normal person. I'm not an Olympic athlete, I'm not very strong, I'm not very tough, I'm very normal. And so to survive on this trip, I needed to be strong up here and to have a good attitude up here. And it's that which I will reflect on and try to apply that a little bit to the, um, as we were hearing, the very challenging worlds in which you move every day. And one of my big attitudes in life, which really underpins everything else, is that life is an adventure. And I think it's great. Whatever we're doing, whether we're at work or whether we're taking on personal challenges, we've always got to treat everything like an adventure. And then everything becomes so much more interesting and fun if we're treating things as an adventure instead of a problem. So let's get started. This was the day that I set off on this journey. And 
Um, you can see, there's me on the left-hand side with my bicycle. It's a very ordinary mountain bike, but I've got lots of bags on the front and the back, and I'll show you what's in the bags in a minute. On the right-hand side is my old school friend, Al, who I was cycling with whilst I was in Siberia. And notice also, the day we set off, it was a beautiful blue sky. And this was September time in Siberia, and it was perfect weather for beginning a big expedition. Well, that's the road we started cycling along. There's only one road in this part of Siberia, so there's no chance of getting lost. But the road starts to head into the wilderness. And Siberia is very different to India because of the human population there. Siberia is actually one fourteenth of the world's land surface, but it's only got less than about 20 million people living there. So it's a very big place with very, very few people in it. And I knew we would be going through this wilderness for the next few months, just rivers, uh, mountains, forests, swamps all around us. One of the strange things we saw as we started cycling were some little towns like this next to the road. The strange thing was many of the towns were completely empty. They were completely abandoned, like ghost towns next to the road. But in other towns, there were people, and the Russian people that we met were incredibly friendly. And they would uh, welcome us into their little houses and offices, and they would say, Welcome to Russia. Welcome to Siberia. We are so happy to have English people visiting us here in Siberia. Welcome, welcome, welcome. But why have you come in September? Because in one month, in October, the Siberian winter is going to arrive. The Siberian winter is very, very, very cold. And we're sorry to say this to you, but if you keep cycling your bike down this road, we think within one month, both of you are going to die. You're going to freeze to death in the winter. So I started to get a little bit nervous about freezing to death. And then some other Russians came up to us and they looked at our clothes and they said, well, if you have enough, uh, if you have enough clothes with you, perhaps you will not freeze to death. Actually, we think it's far more likely you will be eaten by a bear. That is how you will die. And so I started worrying about the bears. And then other people came up to us and said, no, you will not freeze to death. You will not be eaten by bears. You'll be eaten by wolves. That's how you will die. And so everybody I met, they were all very, very friendly, but they were all um, very pessimistic. And they all agreed on the fact we would die. They just couldn't make up their minds how we were going to die. So I was very nervous. I had to take my courage in both hands, and Al and I set off to continue riding into Siberia. And about a week later, like the Russians had warned us, the winter started to arrive. And you can see me looking rather shocked on my first morning of snow outside the tent. One of the first big challenges was that the roads became very icy and slippery. And I don't know if you've ever tried riding a bike on an icy road, but it's not much fun, because every few minutes as we cycled along, suddenly slip, crash, we would fall off onto the ice. And we had to learn to ride the bikes very, very carefully in order to progress. Well, we were starting to get used to camping. We had the usual kind of equipment that you need when you camp. So we had a tent, we had sleeping bags, we had cooking equipment, we had lots of clothes. And then in our other spare bags, we had other things like a toolkit so we could fix our bikes if they broke. We had a first aid kit so we could fix ourselves if we broke. And then we had a few things for our morale. So we had a camera, we had music players, I had a Bible, I had some books. I had all those kind of things to keep, me, uh, keep my morale up when when I was resting at night. Well, we got to this town. It's a town called Susamon, and we'd been going about a thousand uh, kilometers so far, just over a thousand kilometers. And I looked at the map, and I saw from this town onwards on the map there were no more towns for over another thousand kilometers. We'd be completely on our own for the next thousand kilometers. There was just a dotted road, and I didn't quite know what a dotted road meant. Did it mean? There is a road, but it's not very good. Or maybe they're planning on building a road, but they haven't built it yet. I wasn't quite sure. But we asked a few people, and they said, well, there's a road, but it's not very good. So we kept on going, and we started riding out into this total wilderness. And the road now started to really deteriorate. You can see now, if you look at my feet, um, I'm just pushing the bike down this very bumpy track, almost... Um, 
no proper road surface at all, and the temperature, meanwhile, just kept getting colder and colder and colder, until one morning, I got out of the tent, I looked at my thermometer, and I saw the temperature had dropped from zero down to minus 10, minus 20, minus 30, right down to minus 40, which was seriously cold. It was much, much colder than I'd ever experienced before. And if you're interested to know what this feels like, you've never experienced it, then a little experiment you can try when you go home tonight. Open your freezer, put your hand in to get the ice cream out. Just try to remember how your hand feels now. That's about minus 20 in your freezer. So now I want you to imagine doubling how cold your hand feels down to minus 40. And now I want you to keep your hand in there for about six months and see how you feel. And you're beginning to get an idea of a Siberian winter. It's very, very cold for a very, very long time. And everything started to go a bit wrong. Our equipment started to break because of the cold weather. Our water bottles were freezing solid in less than one minute. One day, my friend Al had a bit of a cold, and his nose was dripping, and he had forgotten to bring any handkerchiefs with him. And you can see the results, these beautiful icicle bogies hanging off his moustache. So there were some things to laugh about, but it was very hard. We had to keep going. And I'm just going to show you the first short video clip now. This video clip, um, it, you'll see, it will give you a better feeling for the uh, environment. And in this, we're cycling up a hill. Al is in front. I am behind. I'm holding the video camera and kind of bouncing as I film, and uh, I should also apologise, I'm making a slightly silly commentary as I film, and so you understand the commentary, my surname is Lilwall, and Humphreys, um, Al's surname is Humphreys. Lilwall gaining on Humphreys on the outside of the bend, the great 2004 cycling marathon, and Lilwall's taking the lead, Humphreys, Looking very unhappy about this. Oh, Humphrey's doing some extra effort. Oh, but no more. No more. So it was very tough. But we had to keep a bit of a sense of humour. We had to keep ourselves going. And so we tried to laugh, even though it was freezing cold. And when it's freezing cold, the best way to stay warm is just to keep on moving. So we just kept moving. We would only stop for about five minutes, eat lots of food quickly, and then keep going again. And onwards we went. And as I mentioned before, this was a very empty place. There were no more houses around. Very, very few uh, people living out in this part of Siberia for about 1,000 kilometres. But some days we did meet some rather unusual people and one day I heard a rumbling sound and I looked behind me and this tank was coming down the road. Actually it wasn't the army, it was some friendly Russian gold miners and there's lots of gold in Siberia and they travel around in these tanks between the gold mines. But we had a problem because we... We didn't speak much Russian. I was learning a bit of Russian. I had a kind of uh, MP3 Russian, teach yourself Russian. So I was trying to learn as I went. I didn't speak a lot. And that brings me to my first attitude of adventure, which is communicate creatively. It's so important for us, whatever we're doing in life. I think in your industry, it's all about communication, isn't it? Getting the message across. And we have to be creative. And I know your world is very different to Siberia, but it's the same kind of principle. You have to be creative. Think outside the box, trial and error. And uh, some of the, uh, sometimes we would come to a little gold mine beside the road and there would be smoke coming out of the chimney. And if we saw something like that, we knew it would be warm inside. And so we would go up and we would <coughs> knock on the door. And then a Russian would open the door. He'd be very surprised to see us, but he'd sort of beckon us inside, into the warm. So we're inside in the warm. But we couldn't really communicate. We could say hello and a few other things, but we found it very hard to talk. So I find for, for on a journey like this to communicate, one of the most important things for me was just to smile a lot. If you smile a lot, you make friends, even if you can't understand each other. Smile and try to be friendly. And then another thing I would try to do is a bit of sign language, like I'd say hungry or sleepy or tasty, things like that, which would help. Another thing I used throughout the expedition was I had a letter 
with me. And it started off, I wrote it in English. But then each time I went to a new country, I would try to find somebody, maybe the local English teacher, to translate it into the local language. And so when I was in Russia, a teacher wrote out this letter for me in Russian. So I had a letter written in Russia, Russian. And then when I met these gold miners, I would give them this letter written in Russian. And it would say something like, hello, my name is Rob, this is Al, we are teachers from England. And we are exploring the world on our bicycles. We're having a really, really good time. And everybody in Russia is really, really friendly. Please help us on our way. Something like that. And when people had read it, even though we couldn't talk, they understood what we were up to. And we even had a few phrases like, is there anywhere we can sleep around here, which we could point to. And often when they saw that and they saw other teachers from England, they would invite us into the house and let us sleep inside and look after us. And then the next day, they'd give us breakfast breakfast and onwards we would go and it was incredible the kindness we met as we found ourselves able to communicate and every country in the world that I went through I met so many kind people and it was actually a very heartwarming experience to meet so much kindness along the way. Onwards we went, it started to, the winter got colder and colder, we got further and further um, into Siberia, but eventually we made it all the way down to the coast, and from there we were able to catch a ferry across to Japan. And I was so thankful, I was still alive, and I was excited to be going to Japan, and I thought, finally I'm going to escape from all of this horrible Russian winter weather. There'll be no more snow in Japan. But this was Japan. When I arrived, there was still a lot of snow up in the north, and so we started to head south. They had snow-clearing machines on the road, and we got down to Honshu Island, and it started to rain. And this photo was actually one of the final photos I took with my friend Al, because at this point, I had decided I wanted to go down to Australia. Al wanted to take a shorter route going through China, and he'd already he'd left home before me as well. So he wanted to go a shorter route home, and so we split up. We're still friends, but we split up, and I knew now for probably two more years I would be cycling by myself. And it was pretty scary cycling by myself. I headed down through Japan. You can see there's Mount Fuji on the left-hand side behind the McDonald's. And I made it down to Fukuoka and caught a ferry across to South Korea, cycled up through South Korea, which was beautiful. And then another um, attitude of adventure I was starting to think about now because I was on my own. I had about two years left to go. And it was all beginning to feel very, very intimidating how far I had to go. And I found something I had to do to keep my morale up, to keep my motivation up, was to set specific goals. And we all know about goal setting, don't we? It's something we, we've probably been taught about since we were young. But it's so important. And I think sometimes when we get older, we forget to do it. And I find I need to have a long-term goal. Where am I trying to go? I was trying to cycle to England. That was two years ago two years away, but I knew I was trying to get there. But then, to help my morale, I had a medium-term goal. Where am I trying to get in the next two months? I'm trying to get to Hong Kong. So I knew it's only two months where I'll get to Hong Kong. But sometimes even that seemed too far. So I thought, what's my short-term goal? What is my goal today? My goal today is cycle 100 kilometers. As long as I cycle 100 kilometers, I don't need to worry too much about the other goals. Let's focus on the short-term goals today when I'm finding things tough. And I don't know um, how many people here have written down your goals for the next year. Put your hand up if you've written down your goals for the next year. A few of you, but still well under half. And I'd really encourage you, write them down, because if they're in our heads, they're not very specific. If you write them down, you're much, much more likely to hit them. If you know where the goalposts are, you're much more likely to score a goal. And um, I'd really encourage you, take your time. Just, it only takes an hour or two to think about what are my goals, short, medium, and long. Onwards I went. I'd arrived in China, started cycling south through China. I should point out that's not me. I haven't been collecting extra bags. That was a farmer I overtook on my way south. And China was a beautiful country to cycle in. There were good roads, beautiful mountains, friendly people. And I really enjoyed cycling south through China for a couple of months until I made it to the city of Hong Kong. I was one year into the journey. I was doing quite well, but I was exhausted. And I knew that another attitude of adventure I had to practice was practice self 
care. And I was just speaking with one of the HR managers from Z just now, and we were saying it's really interesting how we teach our children to look after themselves. We teach them, you have to sleep enough, you have to do a bit of exercise, you have to eat healthily, you have to have friends and family. It's really important for our children. But then sometimes when we're adults, we just think, oh, all we've got to do is work, and we only need three hours sleep a night, and we don't look after ourselves. And if we do that for too long, it's very counterproductive. And it's the same on an expedition. If I didn't take breaks, if I didn't take time off, I wouldn't make it home. And so when I got to Hong Kong, I took a couple of months off, I got a job, and I was now planning the next stage of my expedition, which was to go down to Australia. The trouble was, Australia was thousands and thousands of kilometers across the sea. And uh, normally I would catch a ferry across the sea, but there are no ferries from Hong Kong to Australia. It's too far. Most people go in a plane, but I didn't want to fly in a plane. It felt a bit like cheating in the middle of my expedition. So I thought, I can't fly. How on earth can I get to Australia? I am going to have to hitchhike on boats. And I'm going to try and find a boat down to the Philippines, maybe a yacht or a cargo ship. I'll cycle through there, find another boat to Indonesia, another one to Papua New Guinea, and then finally I'll get to Australia. So I talked to lots of people around uh, Hong Kong until eventually I met a guy who had a yacht. And he was sailing across to the Philippines. He needed another person on board to pull the ropes, to steer the ship at night. And we squeezed the bike below deck. I was very seasick for the first few days. But then we set off. Uh, you can see I need a haircut. And after about a week at sea, we made it to the Philippines, which was a beautiful, beautiful country. And I started uh, heading down through the Philippines. It was also quite shocking to see a lot of extreme poverty as I went through the Philippines. And one of the things I was doing on this adventure, as well as having an adventure, growing up, testing myself, learning about the world, I was also raising money for this great children's charity called Viva. So it was really good at the same time as having an adventure to also be helping other people. And I know a lot of corporates in India are very generous with their CSR and so on. And I think that's great when we've got another reason besides just the business. Onwards I went and I got down to Indonesia on a cargo ship and then I found a ferry going across to Papua New Guinea. And another way I had to um, communicate and engage with the global community as I cycled, apart from the people I met face to face, I also had to do a lot of online networking and research. And I didn't have a computer, but I went into internet cafes in towns along my route. And I would go on my email, and I would email all of my friends, and all of my friends of friends, and all of my friends of friends of friends, and I would ask everybody on my email list, does anybody know anybody who lives in the next country I'm going to? And if so, can I have some advice about it? I want first-hand advice. And just before I got to Papua New Guinea, I emailed everybody, and then I got this email back from a friend of a friend, a British guy who lived in Papua New Guinea. This is what he said. I should warn you that travel in Papua New Guinea can be quite dangerous. I've been held at gunpoint and robbed 16 times and have been caught in crossfire from warring tribes using M16s and the like. I don't mean to be negative, but I'm sure you'd want to make informed decisions on where you travel. Well, I got that email. I was pretty terrified. And then I got another one. It just said, expect the unexpected. I mean it. I didn't know what that meant. But I knew this was going to be a very challenging place. I had to take my courage in both hands, prepare, research, plan as best I could. And then I crossed the Indonesian border into Papua New Guinea. The first big challenge was that after a few days, the roads disappeared. And I found myself cycling through the middle of the jungle on these tiny little paths. And it was terrifying because there were no maps, no road signs. I thought I'm going to get completely lost in this jungle. But then a couple of days later, I came to a village. And the, a couple of people I met in the village invited me to stay the night. And I got invited in to a house. And uh, this is Yagi on the left and Anderson, his cousin, on the right. And I told them how terrified I was of getting lost in the jungle. And they said to me, uh, they, they speak good English in Papua New Guinea, and they said to me, look, Rob, if you're so frightened of getting lost in the jungle, why don't we come with you? We will show you a path out of the jungle. We'll walk with you for one day. That will take you back to the sea. 
When you get to the sea, there's a road next to the sea. We call it the beach road, and the beach road will lead you all the way to the next town. And I thought, oh, that's great. Let's go to the beach road. And I felt I could trust them. We'd made friends. And onwards we went the next day. And it felt great to have company um, and uh, to be walking with friends. And you can see in Yagi's hand, he's holding an enormous knife. So I felt a little bit safer as I now headed onwards with some friends. And after about 16 hours of walking through the jungle, we made it back to the sea. And we made it to the beach road that they'd been telling me about. The trouble was, although it was a beautiful beach, it was not a road. It was just a beach. So then I had to start pushing the bike down the beach very slow, about one or two kilometers an hour. Sometimes there would be an inlet from the sea. I'd have to put the bike on a a canoe, ask somebody to paddle me across, or there would be an inlet from the sea with huge waves coming in. I'd have to carry the bike through the sea. And onwards I went through the rivers and... Uh, Sometimes I'd have to walk quickly through the rivers, hoping there weren't too many crocodiles around. Well, I made it into uh, the mountains of Papua New Guinea. Now I had to cross the mountains, and I found some friends, and again, they offered to show me the way. That's John and Tom. And we started walking up into the mountains, pushing the bike, sometimes carrying the bike, sometimes having to hack our way through the jungle. But the big challenge was that the rivers were starting to flood. Rainy season had arrived. There were these ferocious torrents of rivers. And at this point, it was a very, very tough part of the expedition. I was exhausted. I was still one and a half years from home. I was tired. I was feeling a bit ill. I later found out I'd caught malaria and I just felt like giving up at this point but I knew I had to keep going and eventually um, although we got surrounded by flooding rivers we managed to find some fallen trees across the rivers and we just kept on going kept on going and eventually made it and I think sometimes in life that is what we need to do isn't it be resilient we just need to keep on going keep on going and when I was a student I used to be a door-to-door salesman. I used to work as a door-to-door salesman in America in my summer vacations, which was really hard work, knocking on doors, and often people would shut the doors in my face, and it was very hard work, knocking on doors, knocking on doors all day to try and make money when I was a student. But one day, I was finding it very, very difficult because I wasn't selling anything. I was selling children's books, but nobody was buying, and I sat on the pavement, and I felt like crying. I was just going so badly. But then I remembered some advice that my sales manager had given me. And he said, Rob, the answer to all your problems is behind the next door. The answer to all your problems is behind the next door. So you have to keep on knocking. So I thought, okay, the answer to all my problems is behind the next door. I knocked on another door. Again, no success. Knocked on another door. No success. Knocked on another door. Somebody bought my books. And I realized when things are going really badly, we feel like giving up. Sometimes we've just got to get up and keep on going and things will get better. And on this expedition, sometimes my motto was, the answer to all my problems is to go another 100 kilometers. And then the answer to all my problems is another 100 kilometers. And if I keep on going, things will get easier again. And I love this saying, tough times don't last, tough people do. And I love this one too. Good times don't last. They don't, do they? Uh, Good people do. We've got to keep going. Well, we made it out of the jungle. That's me. Uh, You can see looking, my shirt is ripped, my beard is long, my hair's a mess. I was dirty, tired and hungry. But I'd made it through the jungle. I'd made it to the city of Port Moresby. You can see just one more boat ride needed to get me to Australia, only maybe 400 kilometers away to Australia. I thought I'd almost made it, but I need one more boat. And I had about three weeks left on my visa. So I thought, I'll talk to everyone in the city, I'll find a boat. And so I went and I talked to the yacht club. And the yacht club manager was very nice, but he said, sorry, it's typhoon season. There are no more boats going for about six months. You can't get a yacht. So I thought, okay, I can't get a yacht. Then I went to see the shipping companies. They were very friendly, but they said to me, sorry, there's lots of insurance and laws and red tape. You're not allowed to come as a guest on our ships. And so I couldn't get a ship, uh, you know, a cargo ship. And so I was beginning to get worried. I had two weeks left on my visa. And I thought, well, if I can't find a boat within two weeks, I'm going to have to really dig deep in my wallet and buy a plane ticket to Australia. But it'll be a real shame because I don't want to fly on this expedition. But 
I thought, I've got two weeks to find a boat. I'm going to try everything I can. I'm going to talk to everybody I can. And then if I don't find a boat after two weeks, I get on a plane. At least I can look at myself in the mirror and know I tried my hardest. So I started talking to everybody. Um, I started going to parties. Every time I was invited to a party, I went. And I started talking to everyone about boats. When um, I, I met the British High Commissioner, so I went to see the British High Commissioner. He gave me a cup of tea. Very friendly. Couldn't help me with a boat. I even went on Papua New Guinean TV on the news and I was interviewed and I said by the way I'm looking for a boat, nobody got in touch. I was now down to about a week left on my visa, really really running out of ideas. But to tell you what happened next, I have to go back in time about one year to when I was in Shanghai, up at the top of the map. When I was in Shanghai I'd met an English guy called Ed. Ed was very nice and Ed had said um, when you get to Hong Kong you should meet this guy called Angus. He knows all about ships. So when I got to Hong Kong, just where the yellow line starts, I met up with Angus and we went for a drink. Angus was very nice. He couldn't help me with boats, but he said, you should meet my friend Julian. Julian used to work in Papua New Guinea. Now he works in Hong Kong. He'll give you some advice. So I went for a drink with Julian. Julian was very nice, couldn't help me with boats, but he said, when you get to Papua New Guinea, you should meet up with the guy who took over my job. It's a guy called Pete. Pete will be, will be able to give you some advice. So when I got to Port Moresby in Papua New Guinea, I went for a cup of coffee with Pete. Pete was very nice, couldn't help with boats, but he said, next weekend I'm having a tennis party. Do you want to come and play tennis? And I said, sure, I'll come and play tennis with your friends. Went to the tennis party, played some tennis, and I met Pete's friend Sam. Sam introduced me to his girlfriend, Felicity. Neither of them could help with boats, but Felicity said, my friend Helen works in the local school, uh, the local international school. The children would love to hear about your adventures. Why don't you go and talk to them? So I went to the school, and I gave a couple of talks to some school children, and at the end of the talk, I said, by the way, everybody, I'm looking for a boat, just in case you can help. And then I went back to where I was staying, and then the next morning, Helen phones me up, and she said, little Ashley, the little boy in the second row, his uncle has got a luxury dive boat. It's going to Australia on Saturday. Would you like a lift? And I said, you bet I would. And so that's how I found my lift to Australia. And of course, we all know this lesson. Be a networker. Everybody talks about it. It's so important, but it's easy to neglect. And even just things like follow up good courtesy in how we relate to people, help other people out on their journeys of life as well, and we'll never know when we find our luxury dive boat along the way. Well, I made it to Australia, that's what I looked like when I got there, so I shaved my beard off, kept on heading south, and um, I was heading now down towards uh, Sydney, all sorts of animals along the way to look out for, a few snakes to look out for, sunbathing on the road. And people often ask me about this expedition, what happens if you get robbed or what happens if you meet a dangerous animal? And I always find that um, a good question. It's a very good question. But you know something far more risky than getting robbed or dangerous animals on this expedition? It's not quite so exciting. It was just the traffic. That was the number one danger on this trip. Statistically, if something bad was going to happen to me, it would probably be somebody driving along and checking their mobile phone. Much, much more likely than getting shot. On, uh, and it's the same in life. Sometimes we think of these really big, scary risks, and we're just not looking at actually what is actually a more likely risk for us. Got down to Sydney. Onwards from Sydney uh, towards Melbourne, across the Nullarbor Plain, which is this big empty plain with nobody living on it for hundreds and hundreds of kilometres. As I was cycling onto the Nullarbor Plain, I saw somebody walking towards me, and he was pushing something in front of him, which seemed a bit strange because we were in the wilderness. And I got up to this guy, and it was a Japanese man on, it was a Japanese student, and he had decided it was far too easy to ride a bicycle across Australia, so he was going to walk across it, pushing all his things in a baby buggy in front of him. And so there he goes. If by this point of the talk you're beginning to think I'm a little bit crazy, then look at him. I think he's a lot more crazy than I am. Well, I made it to Perth. From Perth, I found a freighter up to Singapore. Got off the boat in Singapore, started heading north, up through Malaysia, getting very hot. I was getting very sweaty and hot. Um, through Thailand and Cambodia, very dusty roads. And if you combine a sweaty face and a dusty road, you get a dusty face. And then onwards I went through Vietnam 
and then up back into China through Yunnan province and up, up, up into the high mountains of Tibet. Really climbing high now and the mountains getting bigger and bigger. Uh, you can see there's a side on profile. Some of the passes over 5,000 meters high. I could hardly breathe when I was at the top. One day I had to push my bike all the way to the top of this pass. At the top, I saw Mount Everest. So that was a big boost to my morale. And onwards, onwards I ran. And I think... Um, it's easy to imagine on an expedition like this that it's a very, very exciting time because there are all these adventures to have. But you know what? On a lot of days, nothing happened. All I would do is I'd get up, cycle 100 kilometers, 150 kilometers, find somewhere to sleep. Nothing happened. Next day, same again, same again, same again. I'd see beautiful things, but it was exhausting and uh, sometimes it was actually almost boring when for... Days and days, weeks and weeks, months and months, I'd just be going down these long roads. And it's the same in life. We have exciting moments in life, but sometimes we just got to get up and do our 100 kilometers a day, get through the day, and gradually we make progress towards our goals. Another thing I, I had to think about was um, solving problems. I had to figure out how do I solve a problem when my bicycle breaks, when the road disappears, when I get lost. I have to have an attitude which will solve problems along the way. And I like this quote, there are two types of people in life. People who find excuses and people who find ways through, round and over their obstacles. And what sort of person are you? Do you, do you often make an excuse when you can't go forward or do you figure out a way through it? Well, that's my next attitude, is be a problem solver. And to illustrate this, which links into the TV world, here's a little problem I had for the TV world. How do you make a TV series without a cameraman? And I'm just going to show you the last short video now, which will show you how I figured out how to do this. <laughs> So you get the idea, you have to be creative, you have to solve the problem and in that last clip which was in Lahore, I'd made friends with some people who were in a little tuk-tuk filming me as uh, I was cycling. So I managed to get those different camera angles even though I was by myself. Well, going back to Tibet, I came down out of Tibet, down, down, down into the lush valleys of Nepal and it was a lot warmer and then I crossed the border into incredible... India, of course, people playing cricket, so that cheered me up a lot. And I didn't have a lot of time in India. I was just cutting through the northeast corner, so I came down to Delhi, and then I went back up towards Amritsar, and I had a wonderful time. Uh, sometimes I found the traffic a bit dangerous on my bicycle, but it was a lot of fun, met a lot of great people, and eventually made it up to Amritsar and crossed the border into uh, Pakistan. And I went up the Grand Trunk Road to Islamabad, turned east, and uh, sorry, turned west. I always got e get east and west mixed up. Um, turned west and went towards Peshawar. And from Peshawar, I was now going to cross into Afghanistan. And I was pretty nervous. We all know Afghanistan is a very dangerous place. But I knew that I couldn't base my research on watching the news on TV. I had to do some first-hand research. So again, I emailed all my friends of friends of friends. And I asked everybody. And then some friends of friends who worked for uh, the UN in Kabul emailed me back. And I, I asked them in my email, I said, is the the whole of Afghanistan dangerous or are just some parts dangerous? And they emailed back and they said the whole of Afghanistan is dangerous but some parts are especially dangerous. And so uh, they said the south of Afghanistan is especially dangerous. Do not go there, whatever you do. Actually the west and the east are also especially dangerous. Do not go there either. But the centre around Kabul and the north are relatively safe. So if you're going to go anywhere, go Kabul and the north. 
And I thought, OK, I'm going to go through Kabul and to the north. The trouble was I had to go over the Khyber Pass in the east from Peshawar to get to Kabul. And that was a very dangerous region. Everybody agreed. And for the first time on the journey, I actually decided it was too dangerous to cycle. And so I put my bike on top of a taxi up to the Khyber Pass, and then I put my bike on top of a bus down to Kabul. And it was about... Uh, maybe 300 kilometers, I broke my rule of cycling the whole trip. But I think it was the right thing to do. And it leads me to this attitude of be a risk taker. We've got to take risks in life, haven't we? we everything's a risk, but we've got, to, we've got to take risks. I'm sure all of you have taken risks to do so well in your own careers. Sometimes we have to do it, but we also have to do our research. And two things I always remember is be prepared to modify plans in light of research. So we do our research and sometimes we have to change the plan because of what we find out. But also we have to remember the person who made no mistakes never made anything. So we have to make a decision and sometimes it has to be a very brave decision and we have to do that. We have to take those risks. So there was the taxi I took uh, to the Khyber Pass and I got to Kabul, then I climbed back on the bicycle and I started cycling again, heading north, meeting mostly very friendly people, but it was very sad in some ways, going through Afghanistan, even more than fear, I felt sadness, seeing the destruction from the war, the people very suspicious, um, mostly friendly, but it was a, a very um, difficult country in some ways to cycle through, through the Hindu Kush, lots of soldiers around, lots of blowing up Russian tanks next to the road. Um, and uh, I made it up to Mazar-e Sharif, and then I headed towards the border and crossed the Oxus River into Uzbekistan. And suddenly, Uzbekistan was very safe, and I was into a new country, heading onwards through Uzbekistan, through Bukhara, which Genghis Khan visited 800 years ago, and onwards now, down towards my next country, which was Iran. And Iran, again, has not got a very friendly reputation in my country. You can see here, this is a government building which says down with the USA. And the Ayatollah Khomeini on the right, he used to call America the great Satan of the world. And he used to call England the little Satan of the world. So I was a bit nervous going into Iran, thinking what will the people be like. But as I cycled, um, I found out, actually, although the government government was not very friendly towards my government, the normal people were very friendly, just like everywhere else in the world. Here are some Iranian policemen. They were so kind, they let me put my tent up outside their police station, then they kept giving me cups of tea, kept taking pictures of me with their mobile phones. One day I was cycling past the Caspian Sea and this guy who had a bicycle shop um, stopped me and he said, come into my bicycle shop. Your bicycle needs some repairs. I'll try and fix it for you. So I said, okay, thank you so much. I took the bike in, gave him the bike. He then spent the next two hours fixing the bike. He took it apart. He put it back together again. He put new spare parts onto it. Sometimes because he didn't have the correct spare parts in his shop, he started taking apart his own bike, putting parts from his bike onto my bike so that he could fix it properly. After two hours, he gave it back. It looked brilliant. I said, thank you so much. I got my wallet out, started getting a bit of money out. And I said, how much money do I owe you for all that hard work? And he said to me, no way. I'm not taking your money because you're a visitor in my country. You're a guest in my country. I refuse to take your money. And I was so moved by that uh, because it had happened so many times across the world. And this is one of my favorite stories um, because this guy, he didn't know me. He wasn't very rich and his country hates my country, apparently, and yet he wanted to help me like that. And it really was a story I'd experienced again and again across the world, engaging with local people, making friends with them, and experiencing incredible kindness. And it's something I want to learn, and really I'm challenged and inspired to learn from all these people across the world. And that's my next uh, attitude of adventure, the final attitude of adventure, in fact, which is we don't have to make it on our own. And it's very easy in life. I think we're living in a very individualistic world these days, where if you're going to make it to the top, you've got to do it by yourself. But actually, 
we, we don't, we don't, nobody's forcing us to help each other out or to receive help, but it's a good attitude to have, to both give and receive. And sometimes we can be quite proactive about that. And I'll just like on the expedition, I had to give and receive as I went. In, in, bus- in the business world, I don't know how many people here, let's have a hand up if you've got a mentor. Who's got a mentor in the room? Just again, well under half. Some of you do. Keep your hand up if in the last two months you've had a really, really helpful meeting with your mentor. Most of you who've got mentors are having really helpful meetings with them. But 80% of people in the room don't have a mentor. And that's something really helpful you're just missing out on. Maybe you can make it on your own. But I can pretty much guarantee if you find somebody who's got more experience, got lots of wisdom that you trust, they'll help you. And they'll make a big difference in your life. And recently I've been seeing an executive coach in Hong Kong to help with some other work I'm doing. It's made an incredible difference, the advice he's given me. Just seeing him for one hour, two hours a month, it makes a huge difference difference. So we don't have to make it on our own. Onwards I went through, uh, through the rest of Iran, then I crossed the border into Turkey and up into Europe, through Greece, then through Italy, past the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and then I found it was very easy to camp in farmers' fields in Europe, just as long as I got up very early in the morning and I left before they'd seen me, nobody seemed to mind, and I continued through Switzerland, up into Belgium and France, and then finally, this was my last night camping in Belgium and the next day I caught a ferry across the English Channel and I arrived at the White Cliffs of Dover. From Dover it just took one day to ride up to London but of course it was raining and I cycled past Big Ben and then up my street and home at last. And I love this little quote here. Sometimes when I consider what tremendous consequences come from little things, I'm tempted to think there are no little things. And I think that really undergirds all of the attitudes of adventure. Often it's the little decisions we make rather than the huge ones which will make a difference in getting to our goals in life, whatever those are. So just to bring you up to date in the last couple of minutes, um, after I finished this expedition, I I wasn't sure what to do. I thought maybe I'll be a teacher again. But then rather to my surprise, a publisher asked me to write a book. So I wrote a book. Uh, Can we keep the the slides up, actually? Thanks. Um, So I wrote a book, and um, that uh, went well. And then I'd also done some filming, as you saw on the expedition. Can uh, Can we have the slides back, please? Thank you. Um, I'd also done some filming on the expedition. And uh, when I was cycling through Italy, just before I got home, I went in to give another talk in another school. And when I was in the school, at the end of the talk, a girl put up her hand and she said, what are you going to do with all your video footage? And I said, I don't know. It's very difficult to get video, you know, get things on TV and I'm just filming it myself. I probably can't get it on TV. I'll probably just put it on YouTube. And uh, then this girl went home and she told her dad, and he was the CEO of National Geographic channels worldwide, which was a bit of a surprise when he suddenly sent me an email the next day and said, let's look at your video footage. So again, small networking activities can sometimes have huge repercussions. But actually, my favorite story from the expedition was when I was in um, Hong Kong. One year, in, oops, sorry, one year into the expedition, I was in Hong Kong, and as I told you, I was looking for a boat to take me across to the Philippines. And whilst I was in Hong Kong, I was there for a couple of months. One night, a friend invited me to a party. And at the party, I sat down next to a beautiful girl. She was a lawyer in Hong Kong. We started talking. We got on really well. I was completely smitten. And then uh, we started to see each other over the next two months. And then I got on a boat to Australia. She flew to England to be a lawyer in England. But we stayed in touch for the next two years and I cycled all the way home. When I got there, she was still there and so I married her. So I even met my wife-to-be in the middle of the expedition. And sometimes I remember at the start of the expedition, the Russians had asked me, why are you on this expedition? And sometimes as a joke, I would just say, I'm looking for a good wife. And then rather to my surprise, I found one. 
So um, Christine and I uh, moved to Hong Kong, back to her home, and then that was a few years ago now. Then uh, the year before last, I went on a new expedition, which instead of cycling home from Siberia, I walked home from Mongolia, from the Gobi Desert to Hong Kong. That's the Yellow River in the winter in China, and made it to Hong Kong. So still doing expeditions, still doing these crazy things, and um, that really brings us up to date. And just to sum up as we finish, these are the eight attitudes of adventure which I've reflected on and which hopefully will, like we were saying, help you to engage with whatever you need to engage with, with the people you need to engage with. Communicate creatively. Set specific goals. Practice self-care. Be resilient. Be a networker. Be a problem solver. Be a risk taker. And remember, we don't have to make it on our own. And just as we close, I thought I'd bring us back to the beginning and say, look, I'm not a very tough person. When I was at school, I was never in the top sports teams, not the sort of person to ride a bicycle 50,000 kilometers. I was never the cleverest person in the classroom. I um, was not the sort of person to end up writing books. And I was never very brave. I used to get frightened of things very easily. And if I'm honest, I still do get frightened of things very easily. But I think if we take these attitudes, we put our whole hearts into life, we remember the small things count, then we'll be really surprised at how far we can go. And I love this J.K. Rowling one as well. It is our choices that show what we truly are far more than our abilities. That's my website. Please do recommend me or get in touch if you're interested in this for other speaking engagements and thank you very much you've been a really really great audience and I think we're going to move into a time of questions now thank you very much thank you Rob how many people want to cycle a little more now <laughs> how many people want to cycle more than 50 kilometers now that's somewhat encouraging okay you know, the two most important things I took away from this is that, one, the dangers and optimism can come from anywhere, right? And support as well as discouragement, pessimism can come from strange places. And how many times are people like us, you know, when we go with a new marketing program or a new outstanding new idea to somebody and says, can we do this? It's people with it uh, at the closest proximity says, nah, it can't be done. And then you have to go and find, which is the second point, scarce resources, which we, if you research carefully and if we focus, we can do a lot with. And I think all of us would admit that some of our best resources, uh, successes have come from scarce resources. But one question I had for you, that's the first question I have. In the wilderness, you know, when you're really out there, and I was watching some of the pictures of Siberia, which I don't even know where to look, right? How do you stay focused for so long? That's my first question, and then I'll ask other people to ask you questions. Mm. Yeah, it's a great question. I think um, probably that idea of the goals, having the long goal is good, but it's too big to focus on that. Having the medium goal of, I've got to get to this next city in three weeks, that's good. But then having the short-term goals was so key, especially somewhere like Siberia. And when we were in Siberia, you know, hundreds of kilometers ahead of us with nothing happening, and actually our visas were running out when we were in, in Russia as well. And we worked out we were going too slowly. So we just did a very simple calculation. We saw how many days have we got on our visa, how many kilometers have we got to go? That means every day we have to cycle about 82, exactly 82 kilometers. And if we don't hit 82 kilometers a day, then we're going to slip behind schedule. We won't get out of Russia and we'll be thrown in prison or something. We'll get in trouble. So that gave us a really clear goal. And it was a difficult goal to achieve, 82 kilometers a day in those conditions. But it meant we got up at 5 a.m. and we just kept on going and we would just say to ourselves all day, 82 kilometers, 82 kilometers, 82 kilometers, until eventually we hit it, put up the tent, slept, got up at 5 a.m., kept on going. And it, we did that day after day and then we got to the the medium-term goal, and we were able to rest and get ready for the next stage. So you have to keep relentlessly reminding yourself as to what you have to do next. Sorry? You have to keep relentlessly reminding yes, yourself. Yes, sometimes life is just relentless. I don't think it's good if it's like that, like without a sort of rest at some point, but some, sometimes we have relentless seasons in life, don't we? Yeah. So who yeah. wants to ask? 
uh, Rob the first question. Good evening. Hi. I would rather like to put co two questions. The first one is, does over planning really helps? And the other question is, during the course of your journey, what motivated you more? The journey that you had covered or the journey which was to start ahead of you? Um, sorry, could you ask the first one again? The first, the first question was, does planning, uh, planning long-term planning that I'm basically talking about mm -hmm. really works? Because the world nowadays is pretty dynamic and you have to adjust to the dynamism of the world and the changing environment. Mm -hmm. So according to me, I may be wrong or right, I somehow feel long-term planning does not help that much. So what is your opinion on this? I think that's a really good question. Yeah, I think um, it was good for me to know where I was going. Like I keep saying, I had my goal, getting home to London. But I couldn't plan the whole trip when I set off. I didn't even get all my visas. I would always be thinking, what do I need to do in the next three months? Like, what visas do I need? What's the weather going to be? What are the dangers? Are there any people I can meet along the way? So I was always asking those questions the next three months. And then, um, yeah, it meant that because, like, a classic example is visas. If I'd got all my visas for three years, some countries change their rules about visas, and so a border closes, and I'd have to do a different route. So absolutely, yeah, I think it's the same in, in a lot of industries in the world today. They're changing quickly. We might have a goal of where we're trying to get to, but we, we shouldn't, like, have an exact plan for how we're going to get there, because we don't know the technology, for example, will probably change. Yeah. Thanks, Second question I had mm -hmm. oh, yeah, was what motivated you more, the journey that you had covered, say mid of your journey, what motivated more the journey that you have already covered or the journey which was yet to come? Oh, that's, that's a good one. Um, I think a bit of both. I think um, the journey I had covered showed me why this was a good experience. It was testing me. It was making me grow as a person. That motivated me to think, oh, I've got more lessons to learn ahead. Um, and it also meant that, let's say, two years into the journey, if I felt like giving up, I'd think that would be such a silly thing to do because I've already done all this and if I give up now, the whole thing will feel, a, you know, I'll regret it for the rest of my life. So I was looking forward to the things ahead, but every time I, I covered somewhere, it gave me kind of strength to go on as well. Yeah. Thanks, Rob. Uh, the gentleman in front? Yeah. Can somebody give him a mic, please? Rob, thanks for that absolutely scintillating uh, experience sharing. Uh, question I had was... Uh, you have done it on cycles, you have done it on foot, you have done dog walks in Israel. So how are these experiences different? I mean, they must be completely meditative moments, but at different velocities, right? Yeah, the walking and the cycling. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, the w it, it's actually a very different experience. In some ways, they're similar because you're still at ground level, meeting people, you're self-sufficient. But I have to say walking, my more, more recent expedition, is much more difficult than cycling. Not just because you're slower, but because you have to carry everything on your body. Whereas a bicycle, all the bags are on the bike frame. And when you carry 25 kilograms, say, in a rucksack, it's very, very exhausting for the body. You get a lot more injuries. Um, things like when you cycle up a hill, you go all the way down the other side for free. When you walk up a hill, you've got to walk down much, much harder in so many ways. So it's a very good experience walking, but it's much more painful, much more intense. Yeah. <laughs> Another one? Anybody else? Hi, I'm Satyam. I just would like to ask one question. What, what about your food experience about all the countries? <laughs> So I'd like to know. Food experience. F food experience, yeah. Okay, my food experience, I was quite varied. Um, I'm quite an uh, unfussy eater, except I don't like boiled eggs. That's the one thing I don't like eating. Um, and I found I didn't, have a lot, I, I didn't have a lot of money on this expedition, so I had to eat quite cheaply which meant often I was cooking my own food. I had a little stove, I lived in a tent, or I would be eating the cheapest food I could find in a country. Um, and so in some countries, like Japan, it's quite an expensive country, I cooked instant noodles from the supermarket because they were very cheap. In somewhere like China, the restaurants are quite cheap, so I could eat 
like nice noodles from a restaurant. Somewhere like Australia, I was very happy that the ice cream was very cheap. And so I'd go to the supermarket in the morning, I'd get a big two litre tub of ice cream, have that for breakfast that I could ride all day. So it was great, I could eat anything I liked as long as it was cheap, I had lots of energy and um, I survived, yeah. <laughs> Hi, I have a question. Yes, please. Go ahead. Where are we? Yeah, it's you. Here. Right here. To your right. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Hi. Uh, okay. Uh, great experience. We would love to uh, do a part of this for sure. Uh, if you could share uh, who was footing your bill and if you could, <laughs> how much was it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so the, in terms of the costs, it cost um, this cycling expedition, I don't know what it is in rupees, uh, it's, just, it's, 100, is it 100 to 1? To, yeah, so it, it cost me 10,000 pounds, so what's that in rupees? Uh, is that a million? About a million rupees it cost, which um, was my life savings from work, which I'd done as a door-to-door -door salesman, as a teacher, those kind of jobs. I'd saved up that money, and I had to make that last for three years. And occasionally I got a job along the way, which helped me a little bit, but I had to live cheaply. And I, I didn't have to carry all of that money with me. I just had a bank card, and in most big cities in the world, you can get out the money. So I'd just get it out, and I had a bit of money kind of hidden in the various bags in my bike to keep me going. So that's how I did that. Okay, our last question before we I have a mingle question. coffee is the gentleman in front here. Yeah, mm. that's it. Yeah, right in front. The gentleman in front with his hand up. The rest of us can chat with Rob over coffee. Rob, what a journey. What a man. Salute you, sir. Um, I don't know, having heard you, having listened to you, I don't know whether courage equates madness or madness is courage. You were speaking earlier on, you said, as you set out on your journey, people told you a lot of scary things and you got nervous. Are you scared of death? If so, why? If not, why not? Were you scared of death on the way? Was I scared of death? Sometimes, yeah. Um, yeah, it was interesting. I think when I did this expedition, I mean, it's a few years ago now, I was still quite young. I was in my mid-twenties, and, you know, I hadn't really thought about death. But sometimes when everybody was telling me, you're going to be dead in a month, you know, it suddenly makes you think, actually, that's, that could happen. And it also made me realise, even if I'm not in, dead in a month, I'm going to be dead one day, and I'd never really thought about that before. And it was quite a kind of, I suppose it's quite a mature thing to realise, isn't it? We've all realised at some point in our life, actually one day I will die. And that's quite a healthy thing in some ways, because it helps put life in perspective. Um, but at the same time, yes, I was terrified. Sometimes I felt quite selfish when I thought, if I do die, my family will be so sad, and so on. And personally, was I afraid of death? Yeah, yeah, death's a scary idea. I'm Christian, which helps in some ways, but I'm still scared of death, I suppose, if I'm honest. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, so when I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll move to coffee and then we can talk to Rob, otherwise we can go on for quite some time, but thanks for, for the enthusiasm. When I first started running long distance, I thought 42 and a half kilometers was the longest distance that anybody could do. I think that we've just expanded our horizons quite considerably this evening. Thank you for doing so. And I'd like all of us to give Rob a really big hand for being here with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Great, thanks.